the NBA draft lottery is broken, and Adam Silver is partially to blame for that reason. Adam Silver failed with the lottery changes, and we're going to break down why here at Utility Sports. I think that the lottery is broken and doesn't complete the changes it was hoping to have enforced on the league. If you guys aren't new to Utility Sports, make sure to leave a like and also subscribe if you do enjoy this content today. A lot of work goes into this. I've studied the NBA draft lottery a ton over the last three uh, three seasons. You know, I knew a lot about it before, but I've really got all of the ins and outs of the draft lottery down. So this is a great place to be for more NBA draft content. And let's get into a video preview. Why was a lottery change necessary? We're talking about the one that Adam Silver executed a few years ago. Then we're also looking at what were those lottery changes? What exactly did Adam Silver tamper with in order to try and help the league in terms of the issue of tanking? Why was this Silver's resolution? Why, in my opinion, it was a failure? And I'm going to use this draft season as the perfect example of why this is a really flawed component to the NBA and something that really does need to get looked at and changed probably. I even have my own idea for a resolution that I think would at least improve it. I don't think it's perfect by any means, but I do think it would improve the issues we see in the NBA, especially come February, March, April, Oklahoma City, I'm talking to you, Portland, I'm talking to you, you guys know what I'm talking about. So let's get into it here. Why was the lottery change necessary? Well, flat out tanking. That is the obvious reason. Tanking has been an issue in the NBA for as long as I can remember. It is an issue. Adam Silver hates tanking as he should. Tanking is a terrible thing for the NBA in a lot of different ways. It's terrible for the fans who spend money on tickets, go out and watch a bad product, or they spend some of their actual time on earth watching a team that doesn't deserve to be watched. No offense to those players who worked really hard to get to that spot. They're just not professional level players at the level that we're talking about. For example, Lindy Waters, solid player, probably would be really good on a lot of college teams, would be good in a lot of different areas. He's not a good NBA player, and it's a waste of people in Oklahoma City's time to go to a Thunder game and watch him play in April. It's just not worth the time. It's not worth the money. And for me, I really love basketball. I love watching those guys play. I do, but we're talking about the casual fan here. And no, I don't think the NBA needs to really care and worry about the casual fan as much, but they want to have a good product on the floor. I think that is the bare minimum that you can expect from the NBA. And this is what tanking does to the league. It leads to less competitive basketball, especially toward the end of the season when we're looking at, again, those February, March, April months. Those are when you get the worst form of basketball, whether that's Alexei Pokashevsky putting up triple doubles because, well, the Thunder are going to run 40 isolations for him. That's not good basketball. There's also going to lead to less people buying tickets, which leads to less people also watching on TV. And when the numbers are down, well, so is the money. And you might say, well, why does that matter to the NBA? Well, the NBA is an organization. It's a business. And the money is really the bottom line. If the NBA wasn't making money, they would fold like we've seen some offshoot football leagues do here in America. When they're not making money, they don't have staying power. That is, quite frankly, the obvious truth about our world. You would hope that the NBA would just stick around even if it wasn't making money. That's not the case. Now, obviously, the NBA makes a ton of money. They're not going anywhere. But Adam Silver, for those of you who do not know this, is essentially an employee of all 30 owners. It's a really weird dynamic because you look at Silver as maybe the head of the NBA. He's really not. The owners are. And Silver's in a role where he's supposed to help the owners make as much money as possible, which is why I think in a lot of ways he's done a really good job because the NBA is growing a ton in his time as commissioner, but also there's some things he's done really bad. And from my perspective, I think that the lottery changes are an example of this. They were even worse before, so don't get me wrong. Adam Silver made them slightly better in my opinion, but I still think there's a lot of room to improve on them. And we're gonna look at those. So what were those lottery changes? Which by the way, I love that the NBA basically trolls us here on NBA draft lottery night. You got the lottery machine out, all the ping pong balls, you're looking at this. And in the background, they put a nice little David Stern, Patrick Ewing, New York Knicks picture. Well done, NBA. Uh, obviously, if you guys don't know about that uh, incident with the uh, frozen envelope, you got a little bit more learning to do. But I, I think the NBA trolling us here is a little funny with that picture in the background. Anyway, back to the video here. The number of teams through the lottery used to be three selections. One, two, and three. Those picks used to be done through the lottery, and the rest would be done by order. Adam Silver changed that to four. One through four now gets done through the lottery, which is probably the widest, most known misconception 
uh, across NBA fans. A lot of people think that the lottery works like a real lottery where all 14 teams are in it. No, only the top four picks are done through the lottery. The rest are done by standing. So because of this, the worst team in the league is guaranteed a top five selection. They have a four or a 52% chance to be anywhere from one through four and a 48% chance to be picked number five with 0% chance of being after pick number five. Because again, from five and later, it's done by standings. So if you are the worst team in the league, you are guaranteed a top five pick. And the second worst team is guaranteed a top six pick, so on and so forth, going down the line. The worst team in the NBA used to have 25% chance odds to get the first overall pick. Adam Silver greatly reduced that down to 14%. And you would think, oh, that's awesome. That's really good for the league. Now less teams are going to want to uh, you know, tank for that number one overall pick. Less teams want to be the worst team in the league. And yes, that's true. And looking at the actual lottery changes here, you can see how it has impacted the first overall pick. Instead of 250 chances out of 1,000 to have the first pick in the draft, you now only have 140, which is the exact same as second and third. And I do really like the fact that one through three are tiered together. I think that the 14% chance stock even odds to have a top three pick between those three teams is really good. No team needs to be the worst team in the league. You just need to be a, a bottom three team in the league, which does limit a little bit of tanking but we're also going to talk about how maybe it allows for even more tanking which is really the double-edged sword here that we're talking about when it gets to tanking look at pick number four here 125 chances i think the most important thing to note the play-in teams teams that don't make the playoffs but almost did have almost no chance at the first overall pick two percent at number 11 1.5 percent 1.0 percent at 13 and half a percent chance if you are number 14, which means, hey, you're in the worst spot possible. You miss the playoffs, don't get any playoff revenue, but hey, you also don't really get to have a, sh a chance at the generational prospect in this year's draft, by the way. You're kind of in NBA purgatory, which is not the place you wanna be. Pick seven, look at it, seven and a half percent chance, still pretty good, right? So that's where you would think, oh, maybe tanking isn't as relevant now because of this. I completely disagree with that, and we're going to look at why. Adam Silver, when he did this, must have thought something of along the lines of, oh, if I make the worst team less likely to get the first pick, nobody will want to try super hard to be the worst team and get the first pick. And that sounds really smart, right? Oh, you know, the first pick has less of an advantage now. Maybe I don't need to be the worst team in the league. And he's completely right. No team tries to be the worst team but a lot of teams try to be a bad team. And that's where the issue is here in the NBA. It's good logic until you actually think about this for more than five seconds. And Adam Silver is in a position where nobody spends time to think about this and really look at alter, you know, alternative options that the NBA could have, which is what I'm doing in this video here. And I'm, you're finding the more and more I think about this, the more critical I am of Adam Silver and the NBA for this, because I think there's a lot of issues still with the way that the lottery is done. Secondly, if there are better odds for the second worst team, third worst team, fourth worst team, fifth worst team, sixth worst team, so on and so forth, all the way through the line until about maybe the ninth, uh, eighth or ninth team, that's you know still really bad, even more teams will want to be bad instead of mediocre in hopes to get the first overall pick. Again, like I said, the worst place to be right now in the NBA is anywhere from 11 to 14. They've tried to incentivize that with the playing games, I don't care. No one wants to win 35 games and have legitimately no chance at the first overall pick. Whereas you could win 28 games and heck you have an, a 28% chance to be in the top four. That is a completely different discussion that we need to look more into. And we're going to third, the biggest issue, each team that is really bad. I'm talking worst team in the league. Second worst team in the league has a draft floor. Like we talked about where Number five is done through standings of the remaining teams that didn't move up in the lottery. That is a mistake again by the NBA. And we're going to look at that even closer here. So look at it here. Let's say, for example, the Orlando Magic were to lose the most games this season. They're the worst team. They are guaranteed a top five pick. Sounds like a pretty good outcome for them. They're young. They're going to give a lot of minutes to young guys. And they're, they go into the lottery saying, hey, we know we have a top five pick here and what's a really good draft class we are completely fine with losing and not trying to win. And if they trade Terrence Ross and they trade some of their other guys like Jonathan Isaac, 
Markel Fultz. You, you look at yourself and say, hey, we did everything we needed to. We gave our young guys minutes. We added some trade compensation pieces. And we're at a point now where we have a top five pick. We're really happy with that. You look at the third team and say, hey, we've got a really good chance to have a top pick. We've got a 27% chance to pick in the top two. We've got roughly a 48 or a 52% chance to pick in the top four. We feel really good about where we're at. And, you know, we tanked. We weren't that good of a team. But, hey, we can sell our fans on the fact that we're trying to get good players for down the road so that we can build something up here. And I like that. I do. I think that these teams, one through three, one through four, that are actually just naturally really bad, you can't try to, to lose 60 games. That, it's so hard to lose that many games in the NBA. It really, really is. Uh, you have to be a really bad team to lose that much because the players and the coaches don't actually want to lose. They go out there and try and win every time. So you have to build a really bad team in order to lose 60 games, which is why those teams need an advantage in the lottery. I 100% agree with that. The issue, though, is you can find a way to lose 48 to 55 games, especially if you're not a team that should be in that area. As long as you have cohesion between the coach and the front office, especially a new coach that's recently introduced and say, hey, we're going to try and get draft picks and, and build this thing up. Look at what Portland did last year. Chauncey Billups, first year head coach. They intentionally sold the entire back end of the season in order to move up higher into the draft. And look at the odds here. Let's look at pick number seven, which historically moves up a ton in Adam Silver's lottery. Seven and a half percent chance to pick number one. The difference between being the seventh best odds here and the ninth best odds could be two wins. A team can really manifest losing two games at the end intentionally if they decide to. Look at what Oklahoma City does every year. Oklahoma City pulls up a bunch of G League guys, and I'm not talking guys who are averaging 20 points a game in the G League. I'm talking about guys who are averaging five points a game in the G League. You know, maybe their seventh or eighth best player, eighth, ninth best player even in some cases from their G League roster up to the NBA and starting them and playing them 28 minutes a night. That is just bad for the NBA. And it's so that they can try and get to the spot where they're the seventh best odds or sixth best odds because these teams in these realms have better opportunities to get a higher pick specifically than those who are at 10. Think about it. If three wins separates the seventh best odds and 10th best odds, and that's a four and a half percent difference between the first overall pick, that is significant, especially when you add up the seventh seed odds to move up into the top four. Look at it. We're talking about 32% chance to move up into the top four, whereas the 10th spot has roughly a 13% chance. That is a significant difference between those two spots. And it might only be a two or three win difference between those teams throughout the regular season. That is really problematic in my opinion for the league. And again, look at the floors here. Pick, if you're the worst team in the league, you're gonna have number five or better. And if you're, you know, the seventh best, you're gonna probably have a good chance at moving up into that top four. And if you're picking 11th, if you have the 11th best odds, well, you basically have no chance. You have less than a 10% chance to move up which means once every 10 years, we'll probably see a team move up like that. Not that we want them to move up consistently, but we don't want the teams who are around 11, 10, 12, 9, we don't want them selling the end of the season. And that's the entire issue right now in the NBA. Orlando wasn't tanking at the end of the year. Orlando was just terrible. Portland, on the other hand, was blatantly tanking. Oklahoma City has shut down Shea Gilgis Alexander for two years in a row and a bruised hip for Josh Giddy shut him down for the season as well. Teams are not playing their good young rookies in order to hopefully get more good young rookies. And that is not what the NBA wants. The NBA wants the bad teams to be bad because those are the teams that deserve the better odds. But the issue is GMs, executives, and now even some coaches when they're in alignment with the executives and GMs are not playing their good, healthy young players in order to better their odds going from that 10th team to maybe the seventh team or the sixth team. And they're getting rewarded Oklahoma city by shutting down Shea early and Josh Giddy early was able to move up to the fourth best odds and end up getting the second overall pick in Chad Holmgren. And now they shut him down for an injury before the season even started without really any reasoning, right? There's, he definitely could probably play this year in my opinion. I'm not a foot specialist, but I, I think that based on his injury, it's very possible he could have returned by the end of the year. They're just shutting him down completely. They don't want to win any games. And you can tell by their roster, they're not trying to. Shea Gilgis Alexander will probably play his last game in January, and Josh Giddy won't play in February. I, you know, that's just the way it's going to be. 
Uh, and it's unfortunate because they're going to try and stack the odds in their favor to get another really good player. And this season is the perfect example of that. The top prospects, Victor Wembanyama, Scoot Henderson, Henderson, excuse me, Nick Smith Jr. from Arkansas, Derek Whitehead from Duke, Dylan Mitchell, Cam Whitmore, Keontae George, you know, there's Derek Lively out there as well. There's a ton of players. Uh, the list goes on and on. There's a lot of guys, especially this year, because it's a very top-heavy class with Wembanyama and Scoot, but it's also a very deep class, which is going to make it one of the best draft classes I ever evaluate probably so the issues with the way the lottery works this year is if you are the worst team and some teams might even tank to try and be the worst team you are guaranteed a pick in the top five which basically means hey if Wembenyama goes if Scoot goes if Nick Smith Jr. and Derek Whitehead goes well heck you still might get Keontae George or Dylan Mitchell or Derek Lively or Cam Whitmore you'll have your pick of that group and that's a really good group to have your pick up so there is going to be some motivation to be the worst team in the league especially when you're competing with other teams in a similar tier to you then second more teams want or will have an improved chance at victor or scoot in my case here you look at a team like let's say the portland trailblazers or the sacramento kings or you could look at even Washington this year, or the New York Knicks, potentially. Teams that are on the outside looking in at the play-in might just say, hey, we're three games back right now of the play-in tournament. It's not likely we make that push. So how about in February here at the trade deadline, we get rid of everybody or we get rid of one key guy and then maybe we sit everybody and we try and lose a bunch and maybe we can get to that seventh best chance or the sixth best chance. And if we do, our percentage increases significantly at getting Victor or Scoot Henderson. And that is really problematic. That's where the blatant tanking, like what we saw last year from Portland, occurs. And it's really, really bad for the league. Third, more teams will tank in February or March than ever before because of these players, because of Victor, because of Scoot. And this draft is a specifically strong draft. So we're gonna see it more than we've ever seen it in my estimation. I could be wrong about that. There's a lot of teams right now that are trying to win, which means there's going to be a lot more teams that are on the outside looking in and weren't really expecting to be there, which is going to give them the opportunity to maybe tank at the end and try and push themselves in position to get Victor Wembanyama or Scoot Henderson or Nick Smith Jr. or Derek Whitehead if they get one of those top four picks done through the lottery. I'm telling you this year, February, March basketball, April basketball, if you're not like me, if you're not a diehard basketball guy, you're just not going to love watching the NBA in those months of the season unless you're watching some of the primetime games, which are typically good games between you know some of the top end teams. So here's my idea. What do we do? I think picks one through seven need to be done through the lottery instead of just picks one through four. And the reason then is if you're the worst team in the league, it's possible. I don't want it to be plausible, but I want it to be possible that maybe you pick eighth overall, which is a significant drop off from picking fifth overall. It's a very different change, and I think it's something that would really lessen the likelihood of a team wanting to be the worst team in the league this year. Then, I think the three worst teams, so one through three, just like how they have it set up now, should have their percentage chance reduced slightly from 14% chance to 10% to have the number one overall pick, which doesn't sound like it's a huge change, but I think it's a vital change here because I want four through 10 to move up to 7% chance to have the first overall pick. You'll notice that number four is actually moving their odds down, whereas number 10 is moving their odds up significantly, same as nine and same as eight. Seven's kind of right around those same odds. I think that 7% is the sweet spot here for a team like who, who's at number 10. They're going to say, hey, we don't really need to try super hard to lose. If our roster is just naturally bad, we can maybe be bad. And 11 through 14. These are the play-in teams. 11, 12, 13, 14 are the teams that make the play-in. That way, their consolation prize, hey, you still have a 5% chance roughly to land the number one overall pick. When you add all of this up, you get exactly 100% to have the number one pick. So some team with my odds here, it's set up in a way that some team will pick first overall. And I think that the best way to do this is have the odds be closer. 11 through 14, are much closer to one through three than they are in the current odds. Remember, right now, number 14 has a 0.5% chance to pick one, whereas the first team has a 14% chance. In this new setup, they have roughly half the percent chance of it. 10% to 5.3%, it's much closer. Yes, could it lead to some really crazy things happening? I definitely think so. 
But if the end goal is to eliminate tanking, eliminate teams wanting to be terrible, you need to give the teams that still miss the playoffs but tried for it a legitimate chance at landing the number one overall pick. 0.5% chance is not going to get the job done. If you want it, want to incentivize teams to win games throughout the regular season, to make a push for the postseason, this is how you need to do it in my idea. Now, I don't think this is perfect, but my thought here is a tiered approach where, hey, the three worst teams are really bad. They need to have a chance to get the first overall pick and a better chance than anybody else. Four through tens, like the teams that are not terrible, but not good either. They're kind of like, eh, I don't really know what to do with you. Let's give you a 7% chance. Seems pretty fair to me. And then 11 to 14, let's commend them for their effort to make the postseason. They tried in the play-in. Things didn't play out for them at the end of the year that they wanted that wanted it to. But hey, your consolation here is your odds aren't terrible. You have a chance here at maybe one of the top prospects in the draft. Uh, and I think it could be something that really helps you sell the, the tickets on, hey, we're going to try and win in March, April. And maybe that will lead to more teams making it into May and June than we were expecting. But at the end of the day, they need to find a way to make tanking less prevalent. And I think this is the best outcome, at least off the top of my head. I'd love to hear your guys' ideas as well in the comment section. Thank you all so much for watching. Hopefully you did enjoy today's video. If you did, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more NBA content like this. Uh, this video is a little bit different from what I normally do. We do have an NBA mock draft up on the channel, though. I study the prospects like no one else, I feel like, on YouTube. So hopefully you guys did enjoy. Thanks again, and we'll catch you in the very next Utility Sports video.